So what I've decided to do here is call out Holocaust denial. Now, you may think that Holocaust denial is the domain of fringe neo-Nazis, but what I have found is that generally recognized to be mainstream Holocaust historians have been denying key aspects of the Holocaust to the degree that they're actually making it easier for the total deniers to make a case. And these gate openers are a much more serious problem than the already marginalized total deniers. For those who know any more facts about the Holocaust that have been denied by mainstream historians, things like mobile crematoria or the pedal power brain bashing machines or the use of diesel engines to execute prisoners, the use of steam chambers, electric plates to execute people, all of which was well documented and proven at Nuremberg, please promote it with the hashtag proven at Nuremberg on Facebook, Twitter, or anywhere else. And don't let the deniers at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, Yad Vashem, or anywhere else continue to deny these facts. Now, what exactly constitutes the mainstream is somewhat nebulous. I think you kind of know it when you see it, but for my purposes, I'll limit it to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, Yad Vashem, and the work of Raoul Hilberg. And I want to show just how much ground these people have given up. Now, the biggest ground was lost when the U.S. Army inspected all of these camps here in the West and claimed that they weren't extermination centers. As we well know, the United States, having just fought a war against Nazi Germany for three and a half years and providing roughly half of all the war material used for all sides against Nazi Germany, had clear pro-Nazi tendencies, which makes them a biased source in their investigations, quote unquote. And they say that these camps were shown to not be extermination centers, despite the fact that at least Dachau and Mauthausen were proven to have homicidal gas chambers at Nuremberg. One document from the International Military Tribunal, the big one, the Blue Book, at Nuremberg. One document from that trial shows, quote, A distinguishing feature of the Dachau camp was the gas chamber for the execution of prisoners and the somewhat elaborate facilities for execution by shooting. The gas chamber was located in the center of a large room in the crematory building. It was built of concrete. Its dimensions were about 20 by 20 feet and the ceiling was some 10 feet high. In two opposite walls of the chamber were airtight doors through which condemned prisoners would be taken into the chamber for execution and removed after execution. The supply of gas into the chamber was controlled by means of two valves on one of the outer walls, and beneath the valves was a small glass-covered peephole through which the operator would watch the victims die. The gas was let into the chamber through pipes, terminating in perforated brass fixtures set into the ceiling. The chamber was of size sufficient to execute probably a hundred men at one time. From the documentary, Dachau Factory of Horrors, presented at the Big Nuremberg Trial as proof of the organized extermination program at Dachau. Quote, Dachau Factory of Horrors, hanging in orderly rows, were the clothes of prisoners who had been suffocated in the lethal gas chamber. They had been persuaded to remove their clothing under the pretext of taking a shower in which towels and soap were provided. This is the browse bath, the shower bath. Inside the shower bath, the gas vents. On the ceiling, the dummy shower heads. In the engineer's room, the intake and outtake pipes. Push buttons to control inflow and outtake of gas. A hand valve to regulate pressure. Cyanide powder was used to generate the lethal smoke. From the gas chamber, the bodies were removed to the crematory. More testimony, this time from the OSS, forerunner of the CIA. And if you don't trust the CIA, who can you trust? It reads, quote, OSS Section 7th Army USA, Dachau Concentration Camp, forward by William W. Quinn, blah, blah, blah. Gas chambers, the internees who were brought to the camp Dachau, for the sole purpose of being executed were in most cases Jews and Russians. They were brought into the compound, lined up near the gas chambers, and were screened in a similar manner as internees who came to Dachau for imprisonment. Then they were marched in a room and told to undress. Everyone was given a towel and a piece of soap, as though they were about to take a shower. During the whole screening process, no hint was ever given that they were to be executed, for the routine was similar upon the arrival of all internees at the camp. Then they entered the gas chamber. Over the entrance, in large black letters, was written browse bad, showers. There were about 15 shower faucets suspended from the ceiling, from which gas was then released. There was one large chamber, capacity for which was 200, and five smaller chambers, and five smaller gas chambers, capacity of each being 50. 
It took approximately 10 minutes for the execution. From the gas chamber, the door led to the crematory, to which the bodies were removed by internees who were selected for the job. The dead bodies were then placed in five furnaces, two to three bodies at a time. Look, when we say extensive documentation for the Holocaust, this is what we're talking about. Documentation at Nuremberg from the OSS, proven in a court of law. And there is much more on the Dachau death camp, with the same kinds of testimony and documentation that proves that the death camps existed in Auschwitz and Belzec, Maidenech, Sobobor, Treblinka. Given that we know that these death camps were real based on testimony and documentation proven under oath at Nuremberg, why then deny that these were also death camps? In addition, men were sentenced to death for their role in the mass extermination programs at Dachau. By denying the extermination program at Dachau, you're calling to question the Nuremberg Tribunals overall and calling into question the death camps in the East. And mainstream historians did the same thing by abandoning Malthausen. From IMT document PS 3870, uh, Polish document 3, 3870, quote, Franz Zeris was interrogated by me in the presence of the commander of the 11th Armored Division, American Armored Division, Sibel the former prisoner and physician Dr. Kozinski, and the presence of another Polish citizen may be unknown for a period of six to eight hours. The interrogation was effected on the night of 22nd of May to 23rd of May, 1945. Franz Rice was seriously wounded. His body had been penetrated by three bullets and knew that he would die shortly and told me the following. A gassing plant was built in the concentration camp Malthausen by order of the former garrison doctor, Dr. Krebsbach camouflaged as a bathroom. Prisoners were gassed in this camouflage bathroom. The gassing of the prisoners was done on the urgen of SS Hauptsturmfuhrer Dr. Kresbosch. SS Gruppfuhrer Glucks gave the order to classify weak prisoners as mentally deranged and kill them by a gas plant which existed in the castle Hartheim near Linz. There, about a million or a million and a half human beings were killed. From IMT document PS 2285. The K prisoners were taken directly to the prison where they were unclothed and taken to the quote-unquote bathrooms. The bathroom in the cellars in the, of the prison building near the crematory was specially designed for executions, shootings, and gassings. The shooting took place by means of a measuring apparatus. The prisoner being backed towards a metrical measure with an automatic contraption releasing a bullet in his neck as soon as the moving plate determining his height touched the top of his head. If a transport consisted of too many K prisoners, instead of losing time for the measuration, they were exterminated by gas sent into the bathroom instead of water. IMT document PS 1515, quote, In one village called Hartheim, there was a large gassing establishment where, in Zerice's estimate, between 1 and 1.5 million people were killed. Other physicians, so-called psychiatrists, proclaimed thousands of inmates as psychiatric cases and sent them to Hartheim. Zerais claims to have seen the records which indicated that four millions were killed in this way. Zerais estimates that in the Warsaw, Kono, Riga, Libau area, 16 million people were killed. 16 million in the Warsaw, Kono, Riga, Libau area alone. Why are mainstream historians denying the unbelievable number of people who are killed? Why revise the numbers downward? Because when you do, you call into question the validity of the charge in its first instance. Like if someone was attacked by a dragon, then someone else t says to them, that's impossible, dragons don't exist. But then the person goes, oh, well, I was attacked by a bear. Okay, now we're supposed to believe that he was attacked by a bear just because he changed his story from the impossible to something possible? No, stop denying. Homicidal gas chambers at Malthausen. 1.5 million people killed there. Done. Proven at Nuremberg. Next, I want to move on to the methods of killing and other atrocities that mainstream Holocaust historians deny. Now, why do they deny these? To protect the Nazis? Why are they trying to minimize the brutality of the Hitler regime? Instead, they have settled on a sterile trifecta of killing methods. Shooting, starvation, and hydrogen cyanide gas chambers which doesn't do justice to the depravity and sadism of the Nazis and the variety of killing methods they used. Take Treblinka, for example. We have sworn affidavits proving the use of steam chambers and electrified floors for mass killing. 
from document 3311 PS, quote, The German authorities, acting under the authority of Governor General Dr. Hans Franks, established in March 1942 the extermination camp at Treblinka, intended for mass killing of Jews by suffocating them in steam chambers. Late in April 1942, the erection of the first three chambers was finished in which these general massacres were to be performed by the means of steam. In these camps, the Jews were put to death by their thousands by hitherto unknown new methods, gas and steam chambers, as well as electric current employed on a large scale. On each side of the corridor are situated five chambers whose height is about six and a half feet. There are no windows. The doors can be shut hermetically. The second building consists of three chambers and a boiler room. The steam generated in the boiler is led by means of pipe to the chambers. The camp is guarded by Germans of the SS detachments and Ukrainians. The officer to whom this guard was subordinated was SS Captain Sauer. The sadism of Sauer in enjoying the shooting personally sounds incredible, but his guilt has been established beyond any doubt. After being filled up to capacity, the chambers were hermetically closed and steam was let in. In a few minutes, it was all over. For the victims transported to the camp in cattle trucks and exposed to several days to the most cruel sufferings of body and soul, death in the steam chambers must have come as a welcome relief. And, here, and more evidence of electric plates used comes from the document 3319 PS. It created murder vans, chambers in the concentration camps, special electrical appliances for mass murder of the doomed, crematoria, and zyklon banks. On page 136 of the document book, we may read that Camp Belsen was founded in 1940, but it was in 1942 that the special electrical appliances were built for the mass extermination of people. Under the pretext that the people were being led to the bathhouse, the doomed were undressed and then driven to the building where the floor was electrified in a special way. There they were killed. I can ask members of the tribunal to refer to page 6 of the album of documents relative to the Lvov camp. One of them is a picture of a trench in the valley of death. The ground is soaked with human blood to a depth of one and a half meters. Literal rivers of blood. Why would you deny this ghoulish imagery? Why sterilize the Holocaust? Another event these mainstream historians are trying to memory hole is the Nazi use of atomic bombs to vaporize 20,000 Jews. Mr. Justice Jackson speaking. And certain experiments were also conducted and certain researches conducted on atomic energy, were they not? Spear, as in Albert Spear. We had not got as far as that, unfortunately, because the finest experts we had in atomic research had emigrated to America, and this had thrown us back a great deal in our research, so that we still needed another year or two in order to achieve any results in splitting Adam, Mr. Justice Jackson. Now, I have certain information which was placed in my hands of an experiment which was carried out near Auschwitz, and I would like to ask you if you heard about it or knew about it. The purpose of the experiment was find a quick and complete way of destroying people without the delay and trouble of shooting and gassing and burning. As it had been carried out, and this is the experiment as I am advised, a village, a small village, was provisionally erected with temporary structures and in approximately 20,000 Jews were put. By means of this newly invented weapon of destruction, those 20,000 people were eradicated almost instantaneously and in such a way that there was no trace. Again, this was revealed in the cross-examination of Albert Speer, the Nazis' chief economic planner. This is prime time. This is at the first international military tribunal put in the blue book. It's the big one, the one that Goering was sitting at, and it was with arguably the number two or at least number three guy in Nazi Germany, Albert Speer, depending on whether you think Speer or Goering was the second most powerful man in Nazi Germany. And this is just swept under the rug. You never hear about that. The public needs to know the truth about the Nazis using atomic weapons, which they had, and instead of using them against the enemy armies, they used them to nuke 20,000 Jews after building a little town for them. That's how depraved they are. They built a little town for them saying, here's your home, and then they used nuclear weapons, which they could have used on their enemy, but instead they used them to kill just 20,000 Jews. We should also look at how Nazis killed people by making them climb trees and then sawing the, the trees down. 
Radomsky and Ryder used all kinds of devices for their extermination of Soviet citizens. For instance, they invented the following method of murder. Several Soviet prisoners would be forced to climb a tree and others had to saw it down. The prisoners would fall together with the tree and be killed. And the mainstream Holocaust historians are denying the well-established mobile killing machines that the Nazis used. The Nazis not only had mobile gas chambers, but also mobile crematoria ovens and mobile bone grinding mills. That's why the remains were never found. If you deny these machines, then you have a problem of a lack of remains for the millions of people Nazis killed in the Soviet Union. Bear witness to the mobile killing and evidence removal machines the Nazis had. Mr. Council Smirnov speaking. Yes, Mr. President, there were also addressed to the SS units. The first letter addressed to the administration of the Auschwitz camp from the firm Topfen Sons. I shall now present to the tribunal evidence of the fact that besides the stationary crematoria, there also existed movable crematoria. The, tri the tribunal already knows about the movable gas chambers. These were murder vans. There were also created transportable crematoria. An SS member, Paul Waldman, testifies to their existence. Oh good, we have eyewitness testimony from the SS itself to confirm mobile cremation units. I mean, what more powerful evidence than a confession from a defeated enemy after a war? He was one of the participants in the crime perpetrated by the German fascists when 840,000 Russian prisoners of war near Sachsenhausen were annihilated at one time. The exhibit number USSR 52 on Auschwitz has already been presented to the court. I quote that particular extract from the testimony of an SS member, Waldman, which mentions the mass execution in Sachsenhausen. The war prisoners murdered in this way were cremated in four movable crematoria, which were transported on car trailers. On the 2nd of May, 1945, there was captured in Berlin a member of the SS, Paul Ludwig Gottlieb Waldman. His testimony is on page 9 of exhibit number USSR 52 entitled Camp Auschwitz. He provides more detailed information on the murders in the camp at Sachsenhausen. In this small room, there was a slot in the wall, approximately 50 centimeters in length. The prisoner of war stood with the back of his head against the slot and the sniper shot him from behind the slot. In practice, this arrangement did not prove satisfactory since the sniper often missed the prisoner. After eight days, a new arrangement was made. The prisoner, as before, was placed against the wall, an iron plate then slowly lowered onto his head. The prisoner was under the impression that he was being measured for his height. The iron plate contained a ramrod which shot out suddenly and poleaxed the prisoner with a blow to the back of the head. He dropped dead. The iron plate was operated by a foot lever in the corner of the room. This is the pedal-powered brain bashing machine. By request of the execution squad, I was also forced to work this apparatus. I shall refer to the subject later. The bodies of the prisoners thus murdered were burned in four mobile crematories, transported in trailers, and attached to motor cars. There was a uniformity of the evil-smelling death machines, which the Germans referred to as gas wagon, but which our people called the soul destroyers. And there was the same technical elaboration in the construction of mobile mills for grinding human bones. So they had mobile gas chambers, mobile crematoria, and mobile bone grinding mills. He continues, All this indicated one sole evil will uniting all the individual assassins and executioners. It became obvious that German thermotechnicians and chemists, architects, toxicologists, mechanics, and physicians were engaged in this rationalization of mass murder on instructions received from Hitler's government. But the unity of this will to evil was not only apparent there, where a special technique had been evolved to serve the purpose of very evil murder. The unity of this will to evil was also apparent from the similarity of methods employed by the murderers. We also have documents showing that the Germans were very professional and even had classes on bone grinding. In the death factory of this camp, special 10-day courses on corpse burning were organized, on which 12 men were employed. On the site where the bodies were exhumed and burned, he explained the practical manner of their burning and how to set up the machinery for bone crushing. I now refer to a document which has already been submitted to the tribunal as document number USSR 61, which is the report of the examination in the town of Lvov of the special machine for the crushing of bones. The machine for crushing bones was mounted on a special carriage on the platform of a trailer. 
It is easily transportable by automobiles or other means of transportation without dismounting. The machine will function in any spot and does not require additional adaptation. It can be transported by automobile or any other vehicle. A machine of these dimensions can produce three cubic meters of calcinated bone powder during one hour. Now, this is important. This, these bone crushing machines are important because the Nazis killed about 1.35 million civilians in mass killing operations in the Soviet Union, according to Raoul Hilberg. Yet the mass graves of these civilians haven't been found, so what happened to them? Well, Raoul Hilberg explains why we can't find the remains of these 1.35 million murdered people. Quote, from, this is from Hilberg, quote, In June 1942, Himmler ordered the commander of Sonder Commando 4A, standard leader, Paul Blobel, to erase the traces of special action group executions in the East. Blobel formed a special command with the designation 1005. The command had the task of digging up graves and burning bodies. Bodies. Blobel traveled all over the occupied territories looking for the graves and conferring with security police officials. Once he took a visitor of the RSHA, Imperial Health Minister, for a ride and, like a guide showing historical places to a tourist, pointed to the mass grave near Kiev, where his own men had killed 34,000 Jews. That's right, from the tip of Narva to the Black Sea, after killing all these people, the special action groups then dug up and destroyed the evidence of 1.35 million dead bodies. And all of this was done by 3,000 men. But Hilberg never mentions the mobile bone grinding mills or the mobile crematoria that would have made this process more efficient. Does he deny they existed? And if he does, what else does he deny? And why would he deny the existence of mobile crematoria and mobile bone crushing machines when these very machines would have made the process of disposing of the evidence possible? All this is absolutely brutal stuff, but we're talking about the Nazis, a cartoonishly evil regime. Next, let's look at the Katyn Forest Massacre. This is an especially egregious episode because after, the, after 1990, the Russians claimed after the Soviet Union fell that it was the Soviets who massacred the Polish officers at Katyn. In the grand scheme of things, it is a depressingly small number of killings compared to the tens of millions that the Nazis have killed elsewhere, but it is extremely important as an episode because it reveals just how comprehensive mainstream Holocaust denial is, and just how many falsifiers of history are denying the truth that was proven at Nuremberg. Let's look at how official and well-documented and authoritatively shown it was that it was the Germans who killed these men at Katyn Forest. I should now like to turn to the brutalities committed by the Hitlerites toward members of the Czechoslovakian, Polish, and Yugoslavian armies. We find in this indictment that one of the most important criminal acts for which the major war criminals are responsible was the mass execution of Polish prisoners of war shot in the Katyn Forest near Smolensk by the German fascist invaders. According to the estimates of medical legal experts, the total number of bodies amounts to over 11,000. The medical legal experts carried out a thorough examination of the bodies exhumed and of the documents and material evidence found on the bodies and in the graves. During the exhumation and examination of the corpses, the commission questioned many witnesses among the local inhabitants. Their testimony permitted the determination of the exact time and circumstances of the crimes committed by the German invaders. On perusal of all material at the disposal of the special commission, that is, the deposition of over 100 witnesses questioned, the date of the medical legal experts, the documents and the material evidence and belongings taken from the graves in Katyn Forest, we can arrive at the following definite conclusion. Skip 1. 2. In the autumn of 1941, in Katyn Forest, the German occupational authorities carried out mass shootings of the Polish prisoners of war from the above-mentioned camps. 3. Mass shootings of the Polish prisoners of war in Katyn Forest were carried out by German military organizations disguised under the specific name Staff 537, Engineer Construction Battalion, commanded by Super Lieutenant Arns and his colleagues Super Lieutenant Rex and Lieutenant Hott. 4. In connection with their deterioration for Germany of the general military and political machinery in, in the beginning of 1943, the German occupational authorities, with a view to provoking incidents, undertook a whole series of measures to ascribe their own misdeeds 
to organizations of the Soviet authorities in order to make mischief between the Russians and the Poles. This is neither here nor there, but apparently the special action groups weren't able to remove the evidence of 11,000 dead Polish officers after having removed the evidence of 1.35 million dead Russians uh, deeper in Russia. But anyway, so we have for the Katyn massacres, 100 witnesses, medical experts, all confirmed that it was the Germans who did this. A mountain of documentation and witnesses all attesting that the Germans did this. How is this possible? If the Germans didn't actually do it, were all the witnesses lying? Were all these witnesses lying in unison, all 100 of them? And also for mainstream historians who deny this Nazi atrocity and instead blame the Soviets for it, do you deny the countless witnesses to the homicidal gas chambers of Dachau and Mauthausen too, all attesting to the same thing? I guess they're all lying in unison? The idea that people could lie in unison and have convergent false testimony. This would imply that people who claim to have similar experiences in UFO abductions or seeing Bigfoot, that they too are all lying in unison. It's preposterous. No, they saw it, and now the Holocaust deniers are trying to say that Katyn was a Soviet op. Another thing that the institutional or mainstream Holocaust deniers deny is the use of human soap. Let's look at this. But besides this, there is another characteristic in the many crimes committed by the German fascists which makes them even more detestable. In many cases, the Germans, having killed their victims, did not stop there, but made the corpses objects of jeers and mockery. Mockery of the dead bodies of victims was common practice in all extermination camps. I remind the tribunal that the bones which had not been calcinated were sold by the German fascists to the firm Strem. The hair of the murdered women was cut off, packed in sacks, pressed, and sent to Germany. In the Danzig Anatomic Institute, semi-industrial experiments in the production of soap from human bodies and the tanning of human skin for industrial purposes was carried out. I submit to the tribunal, exhibit number USSR 197, the testimony of one of the direct participants in the production of soap from human fat. It is the testimony of Sigmund Mazur, who was a laboratory assistant at the Danzig Anatomic Institute. Question. Tell us how the soap was made out of human fat at the Danzig Anatomic Institute. Answer. In the courtyard of the Anatomic Institute, a one-story stone building of three rooms was built during the summer of 1943. This building was erected for the utilization of human bodies and the boiling of bones. This was officially announced by Professor Spanner. This laboratory was called a laboratory of the fabrication of skeletons, the burning of meat, and unnecessary bones. But already during the winter of 1943-44, Professor Spanner ordered us to collect human fat and not throw it away. I will present to the tribunal these molds into which the soap was poured. So he had the molds in which the soap was poured. Okay, direct material evidence that this was going on. Further, I shall prove that this half-finished sample of human soap was really found in Danzig. The fat of the human bodies was collected by Borkman and Reicher. I boiled the soap out of the bodies of women and men. The process of boiling alone took several days, from three to seven. During two manufacturing processes, in which I directly participated, more than 25 kilograms of soap were produced. The amount of human fat necessary for these two processes was 70 to 80 kilograms collected from some 40 bodies. The finished soap was then sent to Professor Spanner, who kept it personally. The work for the production of soap from human bodies has, as far as I know, also interested Hitler's government. The Anatomic Institute was visited by the Minister of Education, Ruse, from Imperial Health leader, Dr. Conti, the Gauleiter of Danzig, Albert Forster, as well as professionals from other medical institutes. I use this human soap for my personal needs for toilet and laundering. For myself, I took four kilograms of this soap. Reichert, Borkman, Von Bargen, and our chief professor, Spanner, also personally used this soap. Now, in addition to this, we have our fine, upstanding military men, British POWs, who also attest to the manufacture of human soap. Men in uniform. Here's what they say. I shall now submit to the tribunal two documents which have been kindly put at our disposal. They are records of sworn statements by two British prisoners of war, in particular that of John Henry Whitton, fine British name, a soldier of the Royal Sussex Regiment. 
The corpses arrived at an average of seven to eight per day. All of them had been beheaded and were naked. They arrived sometimes in a Red Cross wagon containing five to six corpses in a wooden case and sometimes in a small truck which contained three to four corpses. The corpses were unloaded as quickly as possible and taken down into the cellar, which was entered from a side door in the main entrance hall of the Institute, a secret entrance underground into the Institute. They were then put into large metal containers where they were left for approximately four months. Owing to the preservative mixture in which they were stored, this tissue came away from the bones very easily. The tissue was then put into a boiler about the size of a small kitchen table. After boiling the liquid, it was put into white trays about twice the size of a sheet of foolscap and about three centimeters deep. These were the basins which I have already shown the tribunal. Approximately three to four trayfuls per day were obtained from the machine. So, the Nazi corpse factories. And look it up. Look, look up the, the Kaiser's, I mean the Nazi's corpse factories. These are well documented, attested by multiple witnesses, who gave very specific details about how this was done. And yet, despite eyewitness and documentary evidence, material evidence showing the very trays that they were poured in, with specific names, places, mechanisms, the time period, despite all of this, mainstream Holocaust historians now deny that all of this happened. Next, let's look at another example of Nazi brutality that was just swept under the rug by mainstream Holocaust-denying historians, the torture cabinets. Torture cabinets, which were used in the foreign workers' camp in the grounds of Number 4 Armor Shop and those in the dirty, neglect neglected Russian camp were shown to us, and we deposed the following on oath. Photograph A shows an iron cupboard, which was specially manufactured by the firm of Krupp, to torture Russian workers to an extent that cannot possibly be described by words. Men and women were often locked in a compartment in the cupboard in which hardly any man could stand up for long periods. The measurement of this compartment are height 1.52 meters, breadth and depth were 40 and 50 centimeters each. Frequently even two people were kicked and pressed into one compartment. At the top of the cupboard were a few sieve-like air holes through which cold water was poured on the unfortunate victims during the ice-cold winters. The undersigned, Dom, one of the signers, personally saw how three Russian civilian workers were locked into the cupboard, two in one compartment, after they had been beaten up on New Year's Eve, 1945. Two of the Russians had to stay the whole of New Year's Eve locked in the cupboard and cold water was poured into them onto them as well. Now. I think this is enough for now, but there's so much more, so many examples of Nazi barbarity with the same kind of eyewitness and documentary evidence, often even material evidence showing the cupboards themselves, showing the trays themselves, presented in affidavits and under oath at the international military tribunals. And it's the same kind of evidence that proves the hydrogen cyanide gas chambers at Auschwitz that even mainstream Holocaust historians don't deny. But now let me move on to another realm in which the mainstream Holocaust historians are engaged in denial and falsification of history, and that is the kill count. Raoul Hilberg, in his seminal work, The Destruction of the European Jews, cites several individuals to make a case that a paltry 5.1 million Jews were killed. However, if we look at the testimony of the very people Hilberg cited, we see that these men confessed to killing far more than Hilberg says, even as Hilberg uses them as a source. Why is Hilberg revising down the kill count? For example, Hilberg claims that only 1.25 million people were killed at Auschwitz. However, Flip Friedman, who Hilberg cites throughout the book, says, quote, This means that if we include 1941, the Auschwitz, Polish name for Auschwitz, death factory, swallowed up over 5 million people, and according to some accounts, 7 million. Hilberg also quotes Kurt Gerstein, SS sanitation officer, who talks about the total number killed. Quote, This factory, referring to Belzec, has been working since 1942 and manufactures about 11,000 dead per day. When the circle of my friends or myself heard the broadcast from London or the Voice of America, we were often surprised by the innocent angels who spoke of hundreds of thousands of dead when in reality, there were already more than 10 millions. In the year 1943, the Dutch resistance told me through Ubink 
that I was requested not to supply invented atrocities, but to content myself with reproducing the strict truth. Despite my pointing out these things, in August 1942, at the Swedish Embassy in Berlin, people refused to believe these figures. Unfortunately, I reply to it under oath, these figures are exact. Wow, so they were trying to deny the Holocaust even during the war, Gerstein continues. According to my unquestionable documents, I estimate the number of defenseless human beings murdered by Adolf Hitler and Heinrich Himmler at about 20 million. Well, there you have it, 20 million. Hilberg, why aren't you citing this number? Why are you citing Kurt Gerstein, but then revising the number down? Why aren't you citing his conclusion? Why only 11 million total? Or is it even lower than that? Why are mainstream Holocaust historians denying the true extent of the genocide? Why are they backpedaling from the numbers given by confessions of actual Nazis? And the Gerstein report is chock full of documentation, witness accounts, dates and location. It's a really rigorous work loaded with facts and figures, and it is very specific. But its conclusions are denied by institutional Holocaust denial in the form of Raoul Hilberg and U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum and Yad Vashem. So we need to spend less time dealing with the bottom dwellers at the Institute for Historical Review or pariahs like David Irving. They're just a diversion from the much more important form of Holocaust denial that's going on in the mainstream itself. Here's a telling cross-examination of one of Hilberg's sources, Charles Sigmund Bendel, a Romanian Jewish doctor who uh, miraculously survived Auschwitz, a camp designed to exterminate Jews. Uh, and the cross-examination went by this. Question. Do you know the total number of people exterminated in Auschwitz during the entire time the camp existed? Bendel. Over 4 million. Question. During your time there, what was the highest number of gassed persons in Birkenau on any single day? Answer. In June 1944, 25,000 people were gassed day by day. Question. With gas? Answer. With hydrogen cyanide. There were two rooms in each crematory, and crematories one and two, the usual designation is now two and three, they drove 1,000 persons into one room so that both gas chambers together held 2,000 persons. Question, how big were the rooms? Answer, every gas chamber was 10 meters long and four meters wide. The people were pressed so closely together that not one more person could be squeezed in. The SS thought it was uproariously funny to throw children over the heads of those already jammed in the rooms. The corpses were then thrown into mass graves, but their hair was cut off and their teeth were pulled out. I saw it. Question. Was only the gold saved or all the teeth? Answer. The National Socialist Government said it, put no, it puts no store in gold. Despite that, they were able to take 17 tons of gold from 4 million corpses. Question. You have said the gas chambers were 10 by 4 by 1.6 meters large. Is that correct? Answer. Yes. Question. That is 64 meters cubed, is it not? Answer, I'm not quite sure that is not my strong point. Question, how can it be possible to fit 1,000 peop people in a 64 meters cubed room? Answer, that's what you have to ask yourself. It can only be done with German methods. Question, do you seriously maintain that you can fit 10 persons in a half cubic meter of space? Answer, the 4 million people gassed at Auschwitz are proof of it. Now, Bendel has the right attitude that the fact that 4 million were gassed at Auschwitz proves that you can fit four people into a cubic meter or a half, excuse me, a half cubic meter. Question, when you say they took 17 tons of gold from the corpses, are you basing that on a ton of 1,000 kilograms? Answer, yes. Question, then do you also maintain that every victim whether man, woman, child, or baby, would have four grams of gold in his mouth? Answer. It must have been that some had more and others had less or even none. It would depend on the condition of their teeth. And despite citing Bendel throughout the book, Hilberg makes no mention of the four million gassed at Auschwitz, instead sticking to this 1.25 million number, which appears to be fabricated. It doesn't come from any of the sources he cites. Nor does he mention that the Germans crammed 10 people in each half cubic meter, and that each person killed had on average four grams of gold stolen from their teeth, sh showing no respect for the dead, by the way. This 
is the real Holocaust denial, or at least this is the much more important Holocaust denial, institutional Holocaust denial. Now, institutional Holocaust denial and fringe Holocaust denial, they work hand in hand with fringe Holocaust denial claims slowly making their way into the mainstream. It used to be that we all knew the truth, which was that Dachau, Mauthausen, and Bergen-Belsen were all death camps. But by 1960, institutional Holocaust denial had decided that they were going to move the Holocaust east, undercutting the credibility of the whole thing. Another example, the Wannsee Conference, which confirms the Nazi plans to exterminate the Jews by speaking in code words like resettlement. This has since also been dropped by an increasing number of mainstream historians claiming that conference does not lay out any extermination plan. Benjamin Netanyahu, speaking in front of the United Nations, called into question the Wannsee Conference. Quote, there, on January 20, 1942, after a hearty meal, senior Nazi officials met and decided how to exterminate the Jewish people. The detailed minutes of that meeting have been preserved by successive German governments. Here is a copy of those minutes in which the Nazis, it, Nazis issued precise orders to carry out the extermination of the Jews. Is this a lie? Netanyahu referred to the idea that the Wannsee Conference laid out a general extermination plan as an outright lie, a silly story. From the Jewish Telegraph Agency, quote, an Israeli Holocaust scholar has debunked the Wannsee Conference, at which top Nazi officials are said to have gathered at a via in a Berlin suburb in 1942 to draw the blueprints of the final solution. According to Professor Yehuda Bauer of the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, Wannsee was a meeting, but hardly a conference, and little of what was said there was executed in detail. Bauer addressed the opening session of an international conference held here to mark the 50th anniversary of the decision to carry out the final solution. But it was not made at Wannsee, the Czech-born scholar said. The public still repeats time after time the silly story that at Wannsee the extermination of the Jews was arrived at. Wannsee was but a stage in the unfolding of the process of mass murder, he said. Now, why? Why would a Jew want to give up this ground? The Wannsee Conference is the smoking gun that we need. It was how we dealt with a lack of documentation of the most comprehensive killing operation in history. Of 11, excuse me, uh, 20 million people killed in a mass extermination operation without any overall plan for it. Without this smoking gun, there's a major problem, as illustrated by Leon Polyakov in the first comprehensive work on the Holocaust, Harvest of Hate, written in 1951. Polyakov says, quote, The archives of the Third Reich and the depositions and accounts of its leaders make possible a reconstruction, down to the last detail, the origin and development of the plans of aggression, the military campaigns, and the whole array of procedures by which the Nazis intended to reshape the world to their liking. Only the campaign to exterminate the Jews, as regards its conception as well as many other essential aspects, remain shrouded in darkness. Inferences, psychological considerations, and third or fourth hand reports enable us to reconstruct its development with considerable accuracy. Certain details, however, must forever remain unknown. The three or four people chiefly involved in the actual drawing up of the plan for total extermination are dead and no documents have survived. Perhaps none never existed. Yes, the Nazis were meticulous record keepers, but on this, they managed to destroy all the evidence, or perhaps never writing it down at all. Of the roughly 485 tons of documents that the United States seized from the German foreign, foreign Office at the end of World War II, they were not able to find anything linking the Hitler regime to an organized mass extermination plan. And Holocaust deniers have used this to deny what was proven at Nuremberg. They use this to deny the human soap. They use this to deny the pedal-powered brain bashing machines. They use this to deny cutting down people in trees so that and having them die on impact. They use this to deny all of that. And, and this is the importance of the Wan C conference. It's the smoking gun where they spoke in code that they were going to kill all the Jews. And they spoke in code because they knew they were going to lose the war so that when it was uncovered at the end of the war, all they would have is a bunch of code that some brave historians have been reconstructing. Now, Raoul Hilberg describes the lack of any overarching plan for the mass exterminations thusly. Quote, 
What began in 1941 was a process of destruction not planned in advance, not organized by any central agency. There was no blueprint and there was no budget for destructive measures. They were taken step by step, one step at a time. Thus came not so much a plan being carried out, but an incredible meeting of the minds, a consensus mind reading by a far-flung bureaucracy. Elsewhere on this, Hilberg writes, quote, In the final analysis, the destruction of the Jews was not so much a product of laws and commands as it was a matter of spirit, of shared comprehension, of consonance and synchronization. Who shared in this undertaking? What kind of machinery was used for these tasks. The machine of destruction was an aggregate. No one agency was charged with the whole operation. No special agency was created and no special budget was devised to destroy the Jews of Europe. Each organization was to play a specific role in the process and each was to find the means to carry out the task. Hilberg, this is false. This was all laid out in secret code at Wansi. They didn't say it directly, but when they said mass deportations to the East, they meant mass extermination. In fact, you yourself show that you understand the super secret code that they talked in. Says, quote, Gradually the news of the final solution seeped through the ranks of the bureaucracy. The knowledge did not come to all officials at once. How much a man knew depended on his proximity to the destructive operations and on his insight into the nature of the destruction process. Seldom, however, was comprehension recorded on paper. When the bureaucrats had to deal with the deportation matters, they kept referring to a Jewish migration. In official correspondence, the Jews were still wandering. They were evacuated and resettled. They wandered off and disappeared. These terms were not the product of naivete but convenient tools of psychological repression. Exactly, so Hilberg understands the secret code that the Nazis talked in, which they just understood was secret code that was never explicitly stated anywhere because that's what military organizations do. But given this, why then does do people like Hilberg not hold up the Wansley Conference as where the top-down orders were given in this coded language? The Nazis, they just sort of develop informal codes, kind of get the idea that they're supposed to exterminate millions of people. No one person says it, but they kind of get the idea. It's sort of a consent seeps down through the bureaucracy and then they just go, oh, I'm supposed to kill, you know, millions of people in, in death camps with hydrogen cyanide. Got it. Right. That, that's that's how military organizations work. They weren't explicitly told anywhere to gas people to death with diesel engines. But that's what they did. They weren't explicitly told anywhere to design and build mobile crematoria and then destroy any trace of their design and manufacture, but that's what they did. They just, you know, sort of got a feeling that they, that's what they were supposed to do and they, they did that, right? And so they built the mobile uh, bone grinding mills. I agree with Hilberg on this point. Say it loud and proud. The Nazis used coded language to hint, to give, to drop little hints to the camp commanders that they were supposed to kill millions of people. Now I could go on for quite a bit longer. There's a whole constellation of Nazi brutality that mainstream historians just ignore. But if you've gotten this far, you're obviously deeply committed to battling institutional Holocaust denial. So if you can, find whatever examples of long buried facts about the Holocaust, from killing methods to the real numbers that were killed, which I've heard people say if all, the, if all the confessions were taken together, the numbers could add up to over 100 million. People being killed by being made to climb up trees being sawed down, killed by steam chambers and electric plates, vaporized by atomic blasts, locked in torture chests, and killed by having freezing water poured onto them. How their fat was turned into soap, their bones ground into bone meal for industrial purposes, their skin tanned and used for leather lampshades, for leather handbags, and for the very gloves worn by the SS officers at the camp. Their hair used to make clothing and stuffed pillows and mattresses. The mobile gas chamber crematoria bone grinding combos carried around on trucks to comprehensively exterminate millions of Jews and various other Russians on site and then the evidence could then be destroyed in the face of the advancing Red Army. I didn't even get in to the people being shoved into ovens or burned alive, or camp inmates being executed to the rhythm of an orchestra, or 
you know, the lever-powered brain bashing machine disguised as a height measurement device. No, actually, I think I did mention that. Uh, but anyway, don't let this be forgotten. Don't let the millions killed in the gas chambers at Dachau, Mauthausen, and Bergen-Belsen be forgotten either. Hundreds of witnesses and documents presented at the international military tribunals proving this. Don't let the institutional Holocaust deniers continue to claim that the only extermination camps were done in the area that the Soviet Union happened to control, because when they do that, that makes it seem like it's based on lies from the Soviet Union. And the only reason that we still think that it was done there is because no proper investigation from the West was ever done in that area in which the Nazis supposedly committed all the atrocities. Because it makes it seem like where the Nazis committed atrocities have more to do with where the Soviet Union controls the evidence than with the Nazi regime itself. That's why we must insist that the homicidal gassings took place at Dachau, Mauthausen, and Bergen-Belsen. Because if the evidence for that, the documents and witnesses, didn't mean that those were extermination camps, and that hundreds of people could lie in unison about that, that that makes it just that much harder to then just believe that the same kinds of claims about Auschwitz and the Reinhardt camps, which are based on the same kind of evidence. So, for anyone who watched the video this far, join my hashtag, Proven at Nuremberg. Don't let the Nazi brutality be forgotten. And share what forgotten Holocaust atrocities you know about. The evidence that proves mobile crematoria is the same kind of evidence that proves homicidal gassings at Dachau, is the same kind of evidence that proves mass extermination in the camps that the Soviets ended up controlling. The world must know the truth. Share what you know with the hashtag proven at Nuremberg, and let's carry the torch of true Holocaust remembrance.